Welcome to the seventh video in the marketing strategy course. What we're doing today is we are going to complete the planning of our campaign design, taking it through from the point where we left off in the last video, which is that you've made your first communication with your prospect, right through the nurture phase and the close and also beyond. So we've got a lot to cover again, so we'll dive straight in. What we're doing is we're walking the path. We are designing this campaign to deliver our strategic goal and we are meeting our prospect where they are and we are going to walk with them and converse with them as we go. We are going to lead them to where we want them to arrive, which is the place that's going to deliver on our goal. Um, so we've what we've done so far is we have crossed, crafted our overall proposition which means that we're clear on our circuit, we know there's a market, we know there's a problem, we know we can solve it in a unique way, and we have a brand that will reinforce all of that, and that will hopefully then connect with our target market in a way that is appropriate. We've identified how we intend to reach and engage with our target market. We've didn't done that in the last video. Now, we don't always know exactly what's going to work because we're not there yet. We haven't tried it yet. So always important when you are designing a campaign is to leave some wriggle room because we're going to have to test. Because if we're, if we're properly on our edge, then we're going to be trying things. We're going to take into account what we know works in the past, and that's a lot of what we're talking about in this whole series. What are the, the truths and the facts and the basic realities of marketing? Um, and we're also using creativity, which we draw from the future, to inform how do we think it's going to be effective. And then we launch and we try and we test. You cannot do research you can't do enough research to be able to proceed with absolute confidence, pretty much in anything. Or if you do, you're probably going to run out of money before you even start. At the same time, you shouldn't just blindly invest and put too much into a campaign um, without some degree of confidence. So this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to strike that balance. Okay, And that's what uh, marketing on your edge means. So all we have to do now... We've, we've walked up and we've met our prospect. We know where they are. We know who they are. We know what their level of awareness is. And now we just have to complete that journey. We have to walk the rest of the path with them. Okay. So before we carry on, we're going to look at what does a sale mean? And I'm talking about sales as though there's not always a financial transaction that goes on. But very often there will be. Okay, so what has to happen in order to make a sale? I strongly advise um, you go and find a copy of The Secret to Selling Anything by Harry Brown with an E on the end. Um, one of the most amazing books about sales and marketing. And really the essence of that is what we've already discussed, which is that for a transaction to take place in an appropriate way, both parties should value what they are receiving in the trans transaction more than they value what they are giving up in the transaction. And this goes, this holds true for any kind of transaction. It could hold true for a relationship or a marriage as, as much as for buying something in a store. Okay, So, two major things for a sale. Number one, they have to want it. This is incredibly, unbelievably important. And notice I put want, not need. People will quite often invest in stuff they want more than in stuff that they actually need. And also, when it comes to thinking how we're going to use our disposable cash, quite often we've got the things we need pretty much covered. We've got food, roof over our heads, and the bills paid. What we're talking about is very often what's left over. So... The, it, there has to be an emotional appeal. The person has to feel that they want it. It's, it's an old truism in advertising that people 
make a decision to buy based on emotion and then rationalize it, then justify it with logic. So they're justifying a decision they've already made in the back of their minds emotionally, right? Um, so the first thing that has to happen is they have to want it. The appeal is incredibly important. Um, if you read the old masters, if you read John Cable's, Claude Hopkins, uh, etc., they go to great lengths to discover and to test the appeal. You can sell the same product to the same people in many, many different ways using different appeals. And we're going to be talking about that more in the next video. But we have got tools available to us today that these guys couldn't even dream of. Okay, so the appeal has to be there. It's going to solve my problem. It's going to deliver on an opportunity that's there, and it's going to do it in a special way. Um, the second one is it's worth it, right? I've got to want the thing, and it's got to be worth more to me than what I'm giving up. Simple as that, right? This is actually a really, really easy video. This is the, the, the easiest part of the, the whole thing, the easy part. So this is the good news. The steps that you need to take, or may or may not need to take, but you get to decide, are all mapped out for you. We've already looked at the broken down awareness ladder. It's uh, benhunt.com slash AL2, if you want to get hold of that. That's a Google spreadsheet. If you're logged into Google, you can make a copy of it. And you only actually have two main decisions to make, right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna walk this path. We've set out all these various objectives that we need to at least cover if not necessarily include and deliver in every campaign, because, hey, every campaign is different, right? There's two things, two main things you need to decide, aside from do we actually need to cover that thing at all, but first one is how many communications you need to have with your prospect in order to complete that journey. And, and part of that is going to be, you know, how long is the path, literally? Right, um, And then the second one is how much content can you put into each of those communications? Okay, So sometimes I mean, you, you may risk or you may feel that you know, if, if I try and explain too much, uh, then people will get bored. But we'll come back to that question because it's very important. So how do you decide how many communications you need and how much content or how much um, discussion or uh, transfer of information to put into each of those communications. Then, of course, the big decision is also going to be what's the correct format for those communications, but that should really come from the answers to the previous questions, right? How much can you communicate? And then the format is going to be pretty straightforward. We'll just speak briefly about that. Basically, if you can demonstrate how this thing works visually, then you're going to be, you know, want a video to do it, right? Or some kind of imagery or something. If it's non-visual, then you'll be communicating it in words. So that means either the written word or audio, right? So, you know, the, really the shape of whatever it is that you're trying to sell should uh, help you to, to um, distinguish the appropriate media to use for that. Okay, so how do we decide how many communi communications we want and then how much to put into each one? First one, how much do you need to convey? How long is the path? All right, and that depends very much on your prospect's level of awareness when you meet them. All right, so do you have to emphasize the problem? Do you have to um, acknowledge other solutions exist, etc., and, and go through all of those steps, or are they already aware of other solutions? Are they already aware of your solution? So, you know, the length of the path is dictates how many <clears throat> steps that you actually need to take in order to complete the journey. And all we're doing in this campaign design is planning for each of those steps. Right? That's why it's easy. It's already set out for you. All you need to do is to make a decision about how I'm going to achieve each one. And we're going to work through each one during the video. So the second one, how much can you actually convey at each time? So literally, how much can somebody take in in one sitting? Right? Now, 
My general tip is to convey as much information as you can in each session, in each communication. Okay. Now, sometimes people need space and time, whatever. You know, if you've got experience in sales, some types of sales can take weeks or months. Many don't. And I think one of the most common mistakes that we find in marketing is holding off, trying to break down, trying to be too passive about doing the things that you need to do to make the sale. Okay, We're going to work through all those things. Convey as much as you can. All right? Imagine, we quite often use the, um, the metaphor of dating to explain and understand marketing. So if you meet somebody <coughs> for a date and you sit down for 10 minutes and then you look at your watch and go, oh, I'd better go, but let's do this again. What are the chances of you getting another date? You know, how, how much do you need to have done? How much conversation does there need to have been for this other person to be able to make a decision about whether they want to see you again? So that's a key question, right? Have I discovered enough to increase my desire, right? Have I got, is the appeal there? Do I believe that this could be what I'm looking for? Or am I better off playing the field? It's exactly the same in marketing. So very often, and particularly when we fall into the trap of reductionism, when we fall into the trap of, just saying, okay, well, how many people can we get to our website? Right, well, let's drive some people to our website. And, and then you forget about that. And then you think, well, how many people can we uh, get to view the product page? And how many people can we get to sign up for the news? And so on. Whereas in reality, what you really need to be doing is saying, how can we start the conversation with the right people, continue that conversation, as securely as possible. So we're thinking pipes again, not funnels, right? Convey as much as you can in each meeting because you don't want this. You don't want it to be continued, right? You've got somebody's attention. Keep it. <laughs> Just, you know, carry on. Just walk the path with them as much as you can, right? So there's lots of ways of doing it. And I'm not going to go into all the different channels and media and whatever that we've got, because quite honestly, um, we haven't got enough time. And there are lots and lots and lots of different ones and you would get bored, okay? So one example is long form sales letters, okay? You've got long ads, you've got long um, direct mail letters that come through the post. I've just been watching a, a video interview with um, Gary Halbert. And the interviewer asked him, what's the longest direct mail piece you've ever written? And he said it was around 35 pages. Pages. Right? That, that's, that's, a, that's a big <laughs> delivery to come in an envelope. Right? <coughs> but what we're saying is, you've got somebody's attention. If they want what you're selling, if you can establish that appeal, and if you can keep their attention right? They will keep reading. They will keep reading all you've got to say, as long as it's relevant and not boring. If it wanders off track and starts to become boring, they may give up. But if you assume that you are speaking to the person who needs what you're offering. And if you've done your job right, and you've pitched what you're offering in a way that speaks directly to their problem and to what they want, then why won't they keep reading? Stands to reason. So one thing I, I want us all to be doing is to get rid of this idea in our heads that you know we, we're afraid of pushing people away by selling, by doing the job of marketing. Because so the job of marketing is extremely important. What we're doing is we are explaining in all the detail that we need to cover why you need this and why you need to buy it now. Okay, so you've got long form sales letters. You can have long form web pages, right? So it's basically you are trying to get the 
uh, all the way from the immediate attention with a headline right the way through to asking for the sale or whatever the next step is. Right? You could do the same thing in video, lots of different forms. Um, this is an example of a print ad. Okay, This is not particularly long, but you know, just see how many words there are on there. And a lot of adverts today fall into the trap of just having no reason for you to buy the thing, right? Um, you, the general uh, tip is use as many words as you need to use to establish what you need to establish. Use as many words as you need to communicate what you have to communicate. Don't put in extra words for the sake of having extra words. That's just silly. But you, you know, say, and that's what we're going to do. We're going to break down the things that you need to be communicating. Don't be afraid to use all the words that you need in order to communicate it. Okay. And then you've also got, if you, like in the video world, you've got this concept of the sideways sales letter that Jeff Walker introduced in his uh, product launch formula. So what this is basically doing is taking the long form sales letter, which has a progression, a logical sequence, as we've already seen. This is the broken down um, awareness ladder. And it's, it chops that up into a series of videos which you usually you will deliver to people through emails with links okay so you get the first email and it tells you maybe outlines the problem and etc then the second email will do the next bit and then the third email will do the next bit and the idea is that you are gradually educating your prospect as you go along another really interesting format for sales letters which you wouldn't normally associate with a sales letter is the book. You can have ebooks, you can have printed books. All right, so I know we're not meant to be talking too much about specific formats, but the point is this if your path is very long, and if particularly if your prospect isn't sitting there thinking, how do I solve my problem? i.e., they're at step zero, now, they're not even aware of the problem, then a book can surprisingly be a very effective format. So The End of Therapy is a book that I um, helped write with Sharon Small, which is introducing her um, clean language in the context of uh, kind of psychotherapy. And so what you see, it's all in the title. What we actually had to do was we had to establish, first of all, that there was a problem. So because our, our market was therapists who can use this technology really well. Um, but what we had to do is we had to almost trip them up and say, here's why therapy isn't working. And that's what the book does. The subtitle, don't know if you can see it, says why talk therapy is in decline, which it is, and what you can do about it. So what we did through the book was we broke down seven or so reasons why talk therapy fails from its peak about 30 years ago. Um, why does it fail? Why is it ineffective? And then for each one, we brought in, um, so this is what would be better than that. And then we answered that by introducing clean language and then explained how clean language actually does not suffer from all the, the shortcomings of classical talk therapy. Okay, This book is essentially a sales letter because it meets them where they are and it takes them right through in a hundred or so pages to the point where if they've made it that far, wow, suddenly it's like donkey on, on Shrek, you know, suddenly gets to the other side of the, of the rope bridge and goes, oh, you know, I'm here. Without knowing it, if you've followed through from the start, then you will find yourself um, ready to accept the proposition. And it's not the only one. Web design is dead. Could be argued uh, does the same thing. Jeff Walker produced a book called Launch, which is essentially a sales letter. It inoculates you, right? It's essentially a sales letter for the product launch formula. I bet a lot of people who read that book will go on to buy PLF. And then Russell Brunson, 
came out with a book called Dotcom Secrets, the underground playbook for growing your company online. And he was giving that away a couple of years ago for shipping only. This is very, very common at the moment. Think to yourself, why are so many marketers apparently giving books away at basically at cost? Well, the answer is there's something in it for them. This is not altruistic, right? You read Dotcom Secrets and you are going to be sitting there thinking, well, how can I afford these various other programs or, or um, software uh, packages that, that Russell sells? And then he's followed that up recently again with Expert Secrets, the underground playbook for creating a mass movement of people who will pay for your advice, right? Important marketing lesson in there. If it works, do it. Do it again. Keep doing it. Do what works. That's, that's, you know, if you have to boil marketing down to one thing, do what works. Okay. So books, you know, if it needs to be as long as a book, if it needs to be as long as a feature film, that's as long as it needs to be. You are far more likely to fail in your marketing by being too brief than by being too wordy. Okay. <clears throat> so this is the broken down awareness ladder. We covered the first seven steps in the last video, so emphasizing the problem, identifying who it applies to, i.e., you know, you are in this target market. We have to acknowledge that other solutions exist for credibility. We talk about why um, there is a gap and why other solutions may not be fulfilling it quite right, um, looking at the root causes of that. And we start to say, okay, well, what could life be like? Um, you can do this, you can, you know, you are only a step away, it is within reach for you to have this better life, and visualizing the outcome helps to use the emotions to bypass logical objections, and, you know, get you visualizing, fantasizing about that life, in which case, you know, you're really on board. What we're going to do in the rest of this video is work through the rest of these steps, one by one, talk briefly about them. Okay, and then all you need to do to design a campaign is for each of these things, okay, emphasize the problem. How am I going to do it? Right? Identify who this applies to. How am I going to do it? And very often what this means is you're going to write some copy. Um, and this is not the course in copywriting. Okay, but that copy could be used in video, it could be used in a book, it could be used in a sales letter, it could be used wherever. Right? The important thing is just make sure you've done it. Or if you think this step does not apply, absolutely does not apply to you, that's fine. Put a line through it, say it does not apply, no problem, okay? Just please make sure that you've considered every single one of these things to ask does it apply? Because the worst thing that you want is to say, you know, here is the bridge between A and B that I've created for you and for somebody to walk along it and then find actually there's still a gap. I cannot cross this bridge because there's something missing. These are all the things that could be missing. Don't miss them out, right? Don't be guilty of that. Okay, so discrediting alternative solutions. Why is this important? We have to identify the gap. We have to identify the need basically before we can proceed to fulfill the need. Right. If you look at um, all kinds of TV ads, webinars, print ads, whatever it may be, um, a lot of them will talk about why this thing was required. And very often it's because, you know, we looked at what was there on the market. We've tried things ourselves. It's, it can be great if you're actually in the target market yourself because you can then draw on direct personal experience um, to say, you know, this is, we, we tried stuff and nothing quite worked. So we, you know, stepped away and thought, well, what can we do? Okay. If you watch um, Shark Tank in the US or Dragon's Den in the UK, and they're probably equivalent um, business pitching programs in other countries as well, you, you will see this pattern in pitches. You know, why did you create this? And it's all part of building that credibility for your, for your story. Uh, and you'll very often see people saying, well, you know, we were using this and it wasn't quite right. So we thought, what can we come up with? So 
I mean, you have to acknowledge that other solutions exist. We've already done that, okay? And <clears throat> then, of course, we have to explain why they aren't, they don't quite do what you need them to do in order to set up the need, right? We are creating a shape of something that you need before we then proceed to supply it. It's also, as I mentioned last week, it's a defense against the yeah, but objections. One very common objection is, hey, we've got this. That says it works, okay? So that is, you know, it's like, it only takes one objection for somebody to, you know, take themselves off the hook, right? So I don't need to listen to your thing anymore because I've got this thought in my head and you haven't answered it, right? So it's, it's almost like it's like a one-strike situation. Um, you, can, you can do all the other right things right, but if somebody has an objection or a question or a problem with what you're doing and you don't handle it, that could be enough to lose that prospect. And what's worse is you very often don't even know. So that's why this is important. Okay, so that's discrediting alternative solutions. Next, we proceed to set up the need. Now, I, I say we proceed to do that. You don't exactly have to follow this all in order, but generally, you know, whatever your starting step is, you need to consider all of the things that can apply at those steps, right? So let's say we're at step three, so people already know about your, um, your solution, right? You could still do some of the step one things. What is the unrealized possibility? Build a self-relief, uh, self-belief, visualize the outcome. You can still do those. They can still apply at step three market, okay? Um, you don't have to emphasize the problem because they already know about your solutions. So obviously, they already know about the problem, okay? That's just, just explaining how they, the grid works. So the next one is setting up the need, right? We've explained that there is no perfect solution out there right now. So setting up the need is really an answer to the question, why does the problem need to be solved at all? Right? That's not the same as saying there's a problem. Because you can, you can have a problem and you can live with it. So what we're saying is, this is a problem, and this is, the, this is what the problem means. Right? So the, we need to solve this problem. Why do we need to solve this problem? So whatever your answers are for that question, write them down. One, two, well, a couple of things that you could look at for this. One is, say, if we don't solve this problem, then what will life be like? Oh, right, yeah, I didn't really think about that. Do you really want to, you know, be blah, blah, blah in five years' time, etc.? Or what would life be like with a solution? But what if, just imagine if, in five years time you have done this thing now and then okay so this is what we're trying to do there is a missing piece of the bridge they're at a they want to be at b they have so far been unable to cross to b using the existing op options that are available what we're saying is yes there's a hole there there's a gap and then we're going to go ahead and fill that gap so introduce solution is the next one introduce our solution. Our solution is designed to fit the gap, right? That's why we created whatever it is. Nothing else was good enough. Yeah? The we need a we need to solve this, right? And nothing else was good enough. So, we created whatever it is. Makes sense, doesn't it? Right? There's a need create solution. So one thing that you might do is, is to think about, well, why did we have to do this? Right? Why were we forced to come up with something? It may be an option or it may just be inspiration. And why does this solution fit where others don't? That's very important. Okay. And all you, all you need to do is get a piece of paper and sit down and write the answer. If you know your product or service that you're selling, just write it down. Why does this work where others don't work? 
So what is it that's unique and special about this? Right? This is really getting to the essence of your proposition. Now onto step three, now you've introduced your solution. We reinforce the positives and the benefits of it. Okay, why do we do that? Well, kind of goes, with, goes without saying really, but if, imagine that we've got a scales, right? So what am I gonna get? What do I have to give up? Which, is, which wins, okay? If I value what I'm getting more than what I'm giving up, scales tip, and you've got yourself a ready prospect, right? If they're still in the balance, may not. If what I'm giving up is too much, then you, know, you haven't done your job. List all the reasons why our solution is the right one. That's the first step. Get a piece of paper, list all the reason. So it's not just why our solution is the right one, but it's also why, how will this benefit you? And let's just reiterate the difference between features and benefits. Feature is what something does. The benefit is what it does for you. So what does this mean in my life? List them, every single one, okay? Second step is all of them. Keep going. List them all out. You can then decide, actually, we're going to write these into our copy. We're going to explain all of these reasons. There may be some that overlap, there may be some that are not so relevant, but make sure that you are, have loaded that side of the scales with all the positive reasons why I should be saying yes to this offer. Something else to consider, which is very often overlooked, is what is it about saying yes that allows me to be something? We are, we are social animals and we are extremely highly motivated by identity and status. But particularly identity, that's why you get uh, groups of people who tend to dress the same, behave the same, listen to the same music, right? It's because we have a need to belong. We are tribal. So if you can create a tribe and in use your uh, proposition to invite people, not just to have this thing, but to be in the tribe, right? For which buying the thing is the price of entry, then you may find that that speaks to folk on a deeper emotional level, talking directly to their identity. And people have been using belonging and being to sell all kinds of rubbish for a long time. So, yeah, think about it. If you had to write something down for that, what would it be? Okay, so that's reinforcing the positives and the benefits. Next is evidence of why your proposition is ideal. The key word there being evidence. Credibility is absolutely vital. I could tell you that my product is the best thing since sliced bread, but that's only one person's opinion, okay? So you have to believe what I'm saying. So if I tell the story of where this thing came from, then that can certainly help establish a genuine reason why, right? Why is it ideal? Um, but we, we generally need to go beyond that, okay? Nothing beats proof. So proof obviously being, you know, so much evidence that the scales are tipped, okay? Now there's two types of proof, right? Soft and hard, two types of evidence. Soft evidence is social. Soft evidence, the classic one is testimonials, right? So and so from this town who's a retired school teacher says this. If you've got a name, if it's got a location, if it's got a picture, so much the better. If you, you need to be able to believe that. Hard evidence can be more factual, right? In a head-to-head -head test, this fuel outperformed that fuel, you know, got you 15 more miles per tank than the other one. Right? So you see the difference. One is qualitative and emotional. One is quantitative and more logical. Simple as that. Next step that you must consider is how are we going to gather objections? Why do we want to gather objections? Surely our job is to parade what's so great and fantastic and wonderful about this product. You know, why should we delve into the ugly, nasty world? Of the negative well 
This is the reason. There will be objections. All right? Nobody really gets up in the morning and thinks, I'm going to spend me some money today. All right? So it has been proven um, scientifically that prices, looking at prices and the prospect of spending money, activates some of the same circuits in your brain as physical pain. So spending money hurts, you could say, in a manner of speaking, right? Now, what that means is that we have defenses against spending money. If we had no defenses against spending money, we wouldn't have any money left. No, well, somebody would have it, but, <laughs> you know, we just spent all our money. We need um, emotional, but mainly logical defenses allowing us to choose how and where we spend our money, right? What that means is that there will be objections. Whatever you are trying to sell, people will be thinking in the back of their mind, back of their minds, okay, you know, why can I safely ignore this? There will be objections, so you have to plan for it. And in fact, we can turn this to our advantage. So, you know, have it in your mind, we don't necessarily have to say this, but keep it in your mind that it's okay for your prospects to have questions or doubts or issues with what you're saying, right? It's perfectly natural, okay? Now, if you take the a hard stance and saying, actually, you know, if you don't do this, if you don't think that this is the best thing ever, then you're crazy, you're gonna push people away, right? So part of the reason why we say that we meet our prospects and we you know, take them by the arm and we walk with them is it's really important to establish this level of acceptance and reality. It's like, I, I see you, I accept you. you know, what you are thinking and going through right now is absolutely normal. You don't want to make anyone feel like a freak if you're trying to sell them what, whatever you're trying to sell them. Okay? So, of course, you will have questions. Of course, you will have doubts. That's absolutely natural. You may be thinking, you know, how can they possibly say this? Well, Here's how we can possibly say it, right? You may be thinking, this seems like a lot of money. Well, let me tell you why it isn't a lot of money, you know, from this perspective, right? So, asking why, so asking people what their questions and doubts and concerns are does a few things. One of the things is that it shows that you care. So you are, it's helping you to establish that emotional connection with your prospect. It also helps you to improve your marketing. Because, like we said, if you know, people could be trying to cross that bridge and they come to a gap and they go, oh, I can't cross the bridge. I'm going to go back the other way and you know, click on the next Google link or just carry on about my day. Right? And the worst thing is that very, very often you won't know about that because they haven't told you. So asking people what their objections are is important and you know how can you do this well you know there's lots of ways one is you know if you know for any reason you don't want to buy this thing today then drop us an email right or you could have if it's a webinar you can have live q a at the end of that um you could have automated systems from your uh, crm that says, I noticed that you watched my video, but you haven't bought the product. Please, could you tell me, you know, why? Open-ended, and let people tell you why. Because then you are informed, whereas before you were ignorant, and you would stay ignorant if you didn't discover what these objections are, now you're informed and now you can do something about it. One of the things that you could do about it is resolve that objection there and then for the individual prospect, helping them to feel special and loved, and even maybe close a sale directly then, but you can then build that objection and its counter argument into your marketing. So, resolving the negatives and handling objections. Every objection should have a matching reason why. If it doesn't, think about one. Right? Come up, come up with one. Do the work. Um, the key words that you need to consider very often is that's why or the flip side of that is because all right 
So, you know, there's so-and-so objection. So uh, the objection could be, you know, uh, but I already cleaned my dentures with this. Well, we found that the impact of cleaning your dentures with that over a few years was. That's why we looked for a solution that da da okay? Or just turn it around. Because so-and-so has this problem, right? We did this, okay? So that's why and because extremely powerful words in marketing. Resolve these objections or negative things in your copy. Nobody wants to read more text. Nobody wants more emails. Nobody's going to go hunting for FAQs. Why on earth would I want to click on a page called FAQs? Right? Unless I was just desperate to have one particular question answered and I couldn't find any other way to do it. Handle the objections in your copy itself. In the conversation. Weave it in. It's natural. Right? Nothing wrong with objections. They're okay. I expect you to have objections. I expect them to come up at a certain point. So at that point, I'm going to preempt it. I'm going to say, now, this may seem like blah, blah. And then I'm going to um, go ahead and proceed to answer the objection. You do not want to file this important material away on a page just for the sake of it being there. One of the very, very best examples that you can possibly get for the importance of objections and how to handle them comes from David Ogilvy, who before he went into advertising and this is really you know a step into advertising and marketing was a door-to-door -door salesman and one of the things that he sold was the Arga cooker so this is like a heavy cast iron range cooker in um, the UK he was so effective that the Arga company asked him to write a manual to tell the other salesmen how he did it. And this was in the 1930s, right? About 1935, he wrote the Arga sales manual. I've found a PDF copy. Just go to benhunt.com slash Arga and have a look at that thing. One of the things I want you to know is in the 15 pages of this PDF, defense, as in basically handling objections, starts on page 10. So around 35% of the entire manual is how to handle objections. Right? But I really strongly recommend that you get hold of this. You don't have to read every word, but have a look at... Because um, essentially what this is, is in writing a complete guide to how to close a sale with a from a cold prospect okay so handling objections is extremely important before that he goes into the positives and stuff right but he spends more than five pages on objections okay so we've resolved those negatives we've handled objections now we need to prove the value right on a piece of paper how are we going to prove the value how can we prove the value why do we need to do this well, two aspects to a sale. One is I want it. Second one is it's worth the price. So that's the one we're focusing on, right? Okay, well, I, I get it. It sounds like a good idea. I like it. But, you know, do I want to spend that much money? Okay. So even if you've, you could establish a great appeal, but if you don't establish that it's worth the price, you could still lose a person and not even know why. So we can do this a couple of ways. One is that we can appeal to logic. So, okay, this so-and-so is twice the money of these cheaper ones. But let me tell you why you will get that money back many times over. Right? And prove it. Do it in numbers. Okay? Or you can use emotions as well. So... Um, in terms of proving the value with emotion. So you will know when you touch it, you will feel the quality. Example, that's completely emotional, right? And you know that you've spent, or, you know, 
when you see her face light up, etc. Okay, so that's proving the value. Next one is the yes, no, good, bad matrix. The snappily titled yes, no, good, bad matrix. This is something that I came up with a few years ago now. So a lot of people, when they're thinking about promoting or advertising something, will say, okay, it's all about the benefits. Let's big up the benefits. Right? So write down all the reasons why this is a good thing and tell you what they are. Nothing wrong with that. that you should be doing that. I've already told you you should be doing that. So, you know, be doing that. And, you know, some people, the more advanced marketers, will think about... Um, so we talked about the, the benefits of saying yes to this offer. We may then talk about the cost of saying no. Right? So what would life be like next week, next year, whatever, if you don't buy my thing, right? Ah. So we need to big up the cost of saying no, okay? Now, a lot of people will stop there, but we are talking black belt ninja level of marketing, so we're gonna fill in the other two squares as well. What are the benefits of saying no? And we need to downplay the benefits of saying no. All right, we big up the benefits of saying yes, okay? So, hang on, what are the benefits of saying no? Well, one of the things is you keep your money. All right, keeping my money is one of the benefits of saying no, okay? Another one is, oh, I don't have to invest the time or whatever the hassle of going through this purchase and whatever it may entail on, at the other end, okay? Think about those things. What, you tell me, write them down. What are the benefits of saying no? What are the benefits or potential benefits of not taking up this offer? Okay, what can we say to that? All right, how can we diminish the perceived benefits of saying no? And then the final one is the cost of saying yes. Okay, want to diminish the cost of saying yes. All right, so um, yes, it will, has a, you, you need to invest time, you need to invest money, and Here's how we can offset all of that. So make sure you consider all four of those quadrants in the snappily titled Yes, No, Good, Bad Matrix. Moving on to step four. So now somebody should be pretty much convinced of the value of what you're offering and, and what it's going to do for them. Okay. So they're almost ready. So they might be thinking, yes, this is good for me. What we need to do now is to get them to step five where they're actually ready to buy. So, two things. Risk reversal is the first one. Why do we talk about risk reversal? Well, because the risk that's in somebody's head can be a reason for them to, no. No, not today. No, I'm too busy. All right, so risks. Risk are, it's a lot of money. I might lose my money. I may not complete it. I, how do I know if it works? How can I trust, you know, all of these kind of negatives. Okay, what can we do for each one of those? So first one is write them all down. Second one is, okay, even if it sounds nuts, even if it's unreasonable, okay, what could I do to disappear that risk? So very often, one, you know, cost risk is, is a big one, um, guarantees offset the risk of I'm investing money, right? 100% um, satisfaction guarantee. 30 day, 90 day money back guarantee. If for any reason you're not entirely satisfied with this product, just tell me and I will immediately refund your money, every penny, no quibble, okay? What that's doing is it is removing the the potential obstacle to the prospect completing the transaction at this point, right? They could still object later on down the line, but it's taking it away from this point pre-sale. You want to move it to after the sale. Guarantees increased profits. This has been proven. There is no dispute about it, right? So let's say you um, don't have a guarantee. You've just got a great product and you say, this is a great product. Some people will trust you. Some people will say, 
it's a bit risky. When you have a guarantee, some people will call you on the guarantee. In some cases, what you're selling may not work. Somebody may not use it. They may use it wrong, right? People will contact you and demand their money back and you will give it back to them. But here's the thing. The increase in conversion rate from having the guarantee always uh, more than outweighs the response rate of the uh, how many times you actually have to deliver on your guarantee, right? I do not know of any case where having a guarantee has essentially cost a seller money. It just it doesn't happen. That's why keywords. That's why um, Domino's pizza in the 1980s. You know, it was a an irresistible offer. Pizza delivered hot and fresh to your door in 30 minutes or it's free. Well, what's that? Risk reversal. And what we mean by risk reversal is, instead of you as a buyer having the risk, I as the seller will take on the risk. I believe so much in this product that I am prepared to, etc. So at the same time, this is doing another thing, which is um, communicating my level of self-belief as a seller to you. So I, I know, I'm so confident this will work for you that I will make you this guarantee. Try before you buy is another great one. Okay, um, we're working with we've got a uh, an intensive group working through this this stuff, and one of the guys on there is looking at a floor care business. Okay, so what we've got, uh, you know, what can you do as risk reversal for you know carpet cleaning or floor sanding, for example. So, I mean, obviously, you, you can't say, well, I'll come in and sand your floors, and if you're not 100% happy, I'll give you all the money back. That may not work. But one thing you could do, like this is, this is why um, motor dealers let you have a test drive of a car. All right, it's try before you buy. So you get to experience or get a feel for the benefits of it. So, you know, if, if you're doing carpet cleaning, you say, look, let, I will come in. Let's take a small section, okay, this area around the door. Okay, I will come in at no charge. I will clean this for you and I will show you the results that, that we can get. Okay, there's absolutely no obligation. If you want me to, then I will come back the next day and we'll clean the whole carpet or the whole ground floor, whatever it may be. Right, try before you buy. Let me experience it. Okay, another one is um, kind of the sale or return type of idea. Okay, so I will send you your cook's knives. Um, ASOS do this with, with shoes, you know, have done it for years, right? I'll send you this set of knives. F feel free to try them, okay, for 14 days. And if you don't think they're the best knives you've ever used, simply send them back to us um, in the postage paid box and we'll refund your money as well. So, you know, there's no risk. The risk is gone away. There was one that I read of recently, which was uh, going back a few years, um, selling cigars. We will send you this box of cigars. Um, you know, feel free to smoke five. And if you want to keep them, you know, keep them and we'll bill you. If you don't want to keep them, you know, take out the five, send the rest back to us. Great. So we, there's no risk. Uh, scarcity and urgency. We know a lot about this. <coughs> now, this stuff has been done for years and years and years. There's nothing new under the sun, only different media. So, you know, um, only five left in stock. Hurry must end Monday, right? Scarcity. We only have... I've only got three of these left. Okay? When they're gone, they're gone. That's scarcity. Urgency is... Uh, bank holiday sale ends Monday, and that's it. Okay, so scarcity creates urgency. They're just different, you know, it's a different type of urgency. So we've seen this a lot. The point of scarcity and urgency is it helps somebody to make a decision. It forces a yes or no decision. Yeah, I want this. But actually what we want them to do is say, yeah, I want this now. And that's different. That is the difference between, you know, principle and action. 
So, the most important thing from my perspective is that for any scarcity and urgency, there has to be a reason why. It has to be credible. I have to believe why you're saying that this must end now. So, um, one of the common things in, you know, a lot of internet marketers have been influenced by Jeff Walker's product launch formula, which says, open your product for a fixed window of time. So we build up anticipation and excitement in the run-up to the launch, the uh, start of the launch window. And then you can build and build pressure towards the close of the launch window as well. And it works and it really gets people to buy. Um, however, the reason for having a fixed window of opportunity has to be believable. So, um, one of the things is, I mean, this is very difficult to do if you are selling a digital course that's recorded videos. It's like, well, why? Why can't I buy it the next day? Why can't I buy it next month? So, you know, one of the things that you that you may do with that is to say, well, we're going to have a live trainings or something as part of part of that course. Um, whatever it is, just just make it believable. Otherwise, you may actually abuse people's trust and then lose their attention. Ideally, try and find a way to make the reason why for the scarcity, scarcity or the urgency another benefit. Oh, what do you mean by that? Okay. So, um, I've only got three left in stuff. I've only got three copies. Um, they have f flown off the shelves. People have been so have been so impressed with this. They've come back and ordered another six for their friends and family. Right? That's why I've only got three left. Okay. So the the reason for the scarcity is a benefit to you as the buyer. Right? Because the the reason why I've only got three left is because it's so good. Which is a, another reason why you will benefit by saying yes. What about uh, scarcity for a course, I've only got one or two pla two places left on my course, right? Um, so these are, this is for the mastermind program. You know, 10 people have already said, yes, I'm ready to be part of this thing and, and build my business and take it to the next level. Um, you know, you're gonna miss out. So fear of missing out, um, you, you could, join this group of blah 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 so the 10 people that have already come in are really fired up really exciting wonderful businesses i can't wait to get started i've only got two places left um and it starts monday right so that yes aside from the scarcity that there's only two left what they're saying is the reason why there's only two left is because these 10 people have come along and it's so exciting okay so why can you make the reason why sound beneficial so it can't be artificial make it beneficial call to action you've got to have one right it's like you you date somebody for five years and you never take it to the next level they could just get bored and wander off for no other reason than that if you don't ask the answer is always no the only way you can get a yes from your prospect is to ask the damn question. So you need to ask the question, you need to plan for asking the question, build it into your campaign. I don't know how many people out there are marketing with no plan of when they're actually going to ask the question, waiting for the prospect to say, can I come and spend my money with you? It sounds stupid, but it happens. It happens a lot. So we want to move from, yes, I know you're interested. Are you ready to buy? Buy it now. Here's the reason you've got to do it. Get over your fear of selling. If you have done this work that we've been talking about in the last video and this video, and you have a complete case, and you are clear, on all the reasons why they should do this. You are clear and you have written down 
what the cost is to them over time of not doing it. Right? You've resolved the objections, you've understood the objections, right? and you've counted every single one. Then why should you be afraid to say bye? You shouldn't. Because it should be absolutely clear to you and to them that what you are doing is a service to them by offering this thing. It's great. Everybody wins. It's a trade. Yeah, I get your money. You get something that's worth even more. Okay, call to action. Last three things. So step six would be after somebody has said yes, very often people just stop there and don't even think about it. There are other things that you should be doing. First one is reassure about the purchase. There is such a thing called buyer's remorse. Oh, I've just spent a lot of money on that. I don't know. Have you ever seen the movie Glengarry Glen Ross? Yeah, there's a big case of buyer's remorse in there from a, an unethical sale. Um, it's natural, particularly if the sale has been emotional, it's natural to have a come down after the sale. Yeah, I've, you know, could I really afford that? You know, how am I going to tell my wife, husband, whatever, boss, how much I've spent on this? Okay, so we want to help people to, we want to soften the come down of that, right? <clears throat> so one of the things is to appeal to logic, right? Thank you for buying this thing, okay? This is why you've just made a really smart move buying this thing. Okay? And part of what you're doing here as well is to help somebody to have their story ready for explaining to their spouse, boss, friends, co-workers, whatever, peers, right? Give them the story that they can use to justify what they've just done to other people. Okay? Because, again, you know, we're, we're tribal, we are community people, social beings, and, you know, one of the things can be, you know, how am I going to explain this? So help them to explain it. Just tell them again, this is why you've made such a smart move, right? Or you can appeal to emotion. So thank, thank them personally. You know, I really want to thank you for, for taking this step. And I know it takes courage to whatever, you know, um, but I know and I really believe that when you use the product, this will make a big difference in your life. And I would really love it if you would drop me an email or a comment just to say how you've got on with the product and if you've got any issues with it, right? It's just, it's just being nice. It's just you know, understanding your prospect, who is now a customer, and telling them what they would love to hear. Simple as that. So reassure about the purchase. Another thing you could do is to throw in bonuses. Say, so now you've bought this, I just, just as a thank you, I want to send you something else. All right? When you give people stuff, they feel a sense of obligation to, um, to you in return. So I, I want to send you this. It's completely free. You know, Even if you don't like the product, keep the bonus. It's fine. Right? You have now earned some points with that individual. So, last two things, follow-up offers. When somebody has bought from you, don't stop selling to that person, unless it's something that you only ever buy once in your life, right? The most profitable, is, is, it's a truism, it's well known that it's however many times easier or more cost-effective to sell to an existing customer than it is to get a new customer, no matter how Many times we talk about this, it's an extremely easy thing to forget for some reason, right? Sell to the people who have already bought from you. <laughs> Why? Well, logically, you know them, they know you, and you know that they've already bought. So they're people who buy. And that's the other thing, sell to buyers. Even if they haven't already bought from you before, how can you narrow your market to people who have already bought something. The, the person who is most likely to buy your exercise gadget is not somebody who doesn't have an exercise gadget. The person who is most likely to buy your diet book 
or meditation program or whatever it may be is not somebody who doesn't have any diet books or meditation programs. The person who is most likely to buy a diet book is a person who's got a shelf full of diet books. The person who's most likely to buy your magic diet is a person who has previously bought multiple magic diets. Why? Because they're the kind of person that buys magic diets. Simple. So if you can get a mailing list of people who've bought somebody else's diet, you're more likely to sell your diet to them than a general list. Sell to buyers. How can you identify, maybe through pay-per-click ads or social ads or whatever, whatever kind of ads you use, people who have already bought something else that informs you they may be more likely to buy your thing? Right? It's a general open-ended question. I'll leave it with you. How can you track people who've already bought? So um, if you use a kind of CRM system or marketing automation system, you really want to be tagging people who've already bought from you. <clears throat> this is for a few reasons. Um, now if you can remarket, you use remarketing, so showing particular ads to particular people who've already done a certain thing, uh, that may actually prove much more cost effective than just blasting a pay-per-click ad at everybody. Um, but also, you may want to be uh, pitching, this is getting a little bit more advanced, but you may want to be pitching particular kinds of campaigns and offers only at people who have bought before, right? It might be an exclusive offer just because you are so cool, right? Oh yeah, he knows I'm cool, right? Or you may want to pitch other offers at people who haven't bought from you before. So it's worth at least tracking it. Who has and hasn't bought from you in the past? Another thing that you, you see uh, every so often is one-time offers. So this is the example where um, yeah, I've just put in my credit card details because I'm, you're going to send me the free book, right? $7.95 to cover international shipping and postage and handling, right? It's very cheap. Free book. Okay, while you're here, you've got your credit card in your hand. So, you know, I know that this person has just said yes. And we know that people are very likely to say yes again when they've just said yes. So a one-time offer comes up and says, I'm, you know, this is never going to be repeated, but why don't you, if you're interested in, which you have just proven you're interested in because you've said yes to the book about so-and-so, right? Because I know that you've done that and you've just proved that you're into it, why don't you do this? I've got this series of 18 hours of video that will tell you exactly so and so and so, right? People are very often likely to buy then. So you can have upsells, which is, well, why don't you, you know, instead of just getting the basic thing, how about that with the full coaching package? Or how about the special leather or whatever it may be, right? That's an upsell. You want to spend more, get the super version of it. Or cross sell. Right? Things who have bought, people who have bought that are more likely to buy some other things that are complementary. So, you know, you may also want this for the full package. That's follow up offers. Don't discount it, right? The people who are able to outbid you for ads, very likely to be making more money per customer than you are if you stop at the first sale. And remember, there are always new things to sell people. There are always upgrades. Not necessarily just from you. You could sell them other people's stuff as well. And finally, enroll people further in the tribe. What did saying yes to your offer mean? So this is the same question as we asked before. What did saying yes mean that they get to be? All right. Now you are part of my inner circle. You are part of the new generation of. You are part of whatever it may be. Okay? You know? You are one of the innovators in. You decide. What did that get them to be? So then the second question is how can we reinforce that sense of belonging? How can we draw them closer, get them involved in being that? Really build up that sense of identity. Because 
you know, when they feel that belonging, it's very hard to say, now, no, I'm, I want to leave the tribe now. Right? I'm going to go out on my own. If they have a sense of belonging and a sense of loyalty to you, then that's actually going to make them more likely to, to be loyal in future. So how can you reward that? Many of us walk around with loyalty cards from every supermarket in our wallets. Right? That's not the kind of loyalty we mean. But loyalty and repeat purchase, very, very important. Okay, so that's all the steps. We've been through many steps today. And all you need to do to design your campaign is to say, this is what we're going to do for each of those. This is how we think we're going to do it. Even if it's just the case of we're going to write some words down and decide later how we're going to do it, at least you've made a decision. At least you've got a plan. It may not be the perfect one. So, what we're doing at this point is we are simply creating that experience of walking the path. Those are all the logical steps that you really need to achieve from wherever you meet them in their journey of awareness to take them through to the end. There are lots and lots and lots of other things you can do, but these are the ones that I think are the essential ones. Consider every one. That's all you have to do. I've made it really easy for you. Consider every one. Then, depending on what you're selling, who you're selling it to, how much communication you need to achieve in each contact, etc., 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 all the, the various variables and parameters that uh, only you know, it should then be relatively straightforward to know on the appro which is the appropriate format, content, and timing of those communications. Right. There is simply not possible to go into that level of complexity in a course like this. But um, I'm hoping that by you know, setting it out, breaking it down logically for you, that it will make these decisions far simpler than they would be if you were just faced with a completely blank sheet of paper. <clears throat> so, this is nearly the last <coughs> excuse me, video. Um, what we need to do next, finally is to include in our plan how, our, how we are going to mitigate our risks. Now, our risks generally come from stuff we don't know. There has to be stuff we don't know or else we're not trying. So what are the unknowns? What assumptions have we made? How can we test those assumptions? And how can we do that in a way that's both rapid enough and cost-effective? And that's what we're going to be doing in the next video. Thanks very much for uh, listening to me. We've covered an awful lot of information. My hope is that you are now excited to be planning that campaign now that we've hopefully demystified it and made it simpler for you. Remember, you don't have to be a marketing genius. You don't have to be an amazing copywriter. Very often, it's just a, just a case of putting down what the facts are because that is the difference that's going to make a much bigger difference than copywriting design skill because ultimately at the end of the day you know what are we what are we trying to do we're trying to help people so all we have to say to them is this is what i can do to solve this issue for you these are all the reasons why it's going to work um, these are all the reasons why you might think it's not right and let me give you my answers for those how about it right? and you don't have to be a copywriting whiz to get good results doing that. Thanks again for your time.